You know, it's not entirely straightforward to make Apache Kafka cloud native. That's why it's good that we have Gwen Shapira on the job. Gwen comes back to the show today to talk about what her team and other teams have done to help take the open source Apache Kafka, which was hatched in a world before modern cloud native assumptions were really in place and bring it into bring it to life in a service like Confluent Cloud. It's a great conversation. Before we get there, a reminder that streaming audio is brought to you by Confluent Developer. That's developer.confluent.io. Go there, not right now, but as soon as you're done listening to this episode, and you'll find things like video courses, a library of event-driven design patterns, executable tutorials to get you hands-on coding with Kafka and KSQLDB and Kafka streams. Really everything you could need to get started. When you do, you'll probably want to sign up for Confluent Cloud to do exercises. Use the code PODCAST100 to get an extra $100 of free credit. Now let's get to the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Streaming Audio. I'm your host, Tim Berglund, and I have with me today Gwen Shapira, returning guest and uh, host of podcast on this ex host. Okay, I would like to say host, but once and future host of content on this very channel. Gwen, welcome to the show. It's great being here with you, Tim. <laughs> um, in case anybody doesn't know, uh, what are you up to these days? You're, you're, you're a fairly well-known person in the Kafka community, but what are you doing now? Yeah, so I am managing the Cloud Native Kafka team, which is part of the Kafka org at Confluent. I think it will not be a surprise to anyone. Confluent has quite a large organization focusing on Kafka engineering and investing in Kafka. And uh, as part of it, uh, we want to develop sp features specifically for making Kafka have a better experience in the cloud. And that's something that you really have to think from the ground up because it's not like we always made a joke, right? The cloud is someone else's computer. So like it, but if you just take Kafka and plop it on someone else's computer, well, you have Kafka on someone else's computer. But if you look at what cloud native data services give you, if you look at something like Aurora and uh, S3, uh, they give you a totally different experience. Like there is nothing you can plop on a machine that will give you the S3 experience, the Aurora experience. So we took a step back and thought, what will allow Confluent Cloud to give the same kind of experience to Kafka? And we were thinking, okay, elasticity is a big part of it. Like, you never have to think about capacity planning for S3. I never had to. No. Uh, Aurora has Aurora serverless, it auto scales. So that's clearly really important. Uh, things like being very API driven is very important. Kafka has APIs, but you kind of have to install REST proxy on the side to it. Uh, Confluent Cloud aims to just be API native. Okay. Uh, things like um, going very high scale. Again, like you're never afraid that you will run out of S3, that you lose so much S3 that the cloud will run out of it. I, we don't want people to worry Nobody about ever running out of Kafka. Right. And then also things like um, multi-tenancy is uh, kind of important. I mean, native cloud services allow the people who run them to be very efficient uh, by actually putting a lot of logical customers on the same physical machines. And again, with S3, you don't know who else is running S3 on the same machines, but it's probably everyone. <laughs> Maybe everyone except Netflix, something like that. So um, we're, that thinking, we're basically a... looking at world-class <laughs> cloud services and how can we make Kafka on Confluent Cloud that way. Work that way. The concept of a machine in S3, you're like, wait, what? What? You yeah, know, I mean, we you know they're there, but that's not a thing that you think about in the in exactly. The like if you think about it, if someone asks you, "Is there machines in S3?" You'd be like, "Yeah, probably somewhere <laughs> has to be." <laughs> yeah, are there servers and serverless? There are, but you don't yeah. know it. Yeah, and I think people kind of focus on yeah, of course there are servers, of course there's never serverless. Like the, everything is everything is ones and zeros running on transistors being manufactured or maybe right. not manufactured in Taiwan. 
but um, if you, I think it is a kind of an engineering tendency to not think about what it looks like to the users and to the customer. And the customer experience is vastly different between give me five Kafka boxes with that, that much CPU and that much memory versus I'm going to have certain topics, 400 partitions, 200 megabytes a second. I need something that will give me that. And tomorrow I actually need 800 megabytes per second. I want it to just give me that. <laughs> And when Kafka was born, let's say 2011, um, that, that's not pre-cloud, right? The cloud was very much a thing, but these cloud-native data server, and it, it, it's not pre-S3. S3 was, it was six or seven years before that, but um, the, the cloud-native experience that you're describing uh, isn't really the context that Kafka was born in. Kafka yeah, was born- I think back then, even though cloud was popular, it was still like an SMB thing, like if you had a startup, like nobody thought that enterprises will run on the cloud. Nobody thought that one day, you know, the Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley's of the world will be on the cloud. And even like, you know, two, three years ago, you listen to an interview with JP Morgan and they tell you, oh yeah, no, we don't have cloud solidity. Cloud is good for other people, right. for those crazy people in Silicon Valley, right. but it's not our thing. We are a bank. And if you talk to the exact same people at JP Morgan today, it's like, oh, we have, of course we have a cloud strategy. I mean, every, what CTO does not have a cloud strategy? Everybody's got a, I mean, that's just obvious, of course. It's, uh, we've been doing that all along. Right. That transition has been made. Um, exactly. And uh, so Kafka in 2011, in its, in its inception, again, the assumption was there are, there are boxes, there's sheet metal, you can cut your finger on the sheet metal. It's cold and noisy in the room and it dries your skin out. And, and that's, yeah. that's that world. Uh, and I do want to point out that the fact that Kafka was designed initially with this kind of mechanical sympathy, like with a lot of affinity for the metal, this is actually not working against us. <laughs> this is actually working for us because one of the things that everyone really wants in the cloud service is to have really, really consistent performance. Any slowdown is obviously a disruption. And like the customer expectations really changed that, yeah, we, we are buying a service. We want it to be the exact same service, performance included day in, day out, no nasty surprises. And the fact that Kafka was actually built for this perf highly performant experience from the ground up is still serving us extremely well. Good, good. Now, your team recently wrote a series of blog posts on this work of, of how to take, you know, the, the Kafka that everybody knows uh, and is familiar with and, you know, what, what do you have to do to turn it into this, this cloud native experience? Um, we're going to, those are linked in the show notes, uh, those blog posts, of course, and you should go read them. But I kind of wanted to give everybody like the Gwen Shapiro summary. Um, why don't you just kind of take it away? Well, let's just talk through yeah, what sure. you've been doing. So first of all, we start, I started by kind of just putting, if anything, like my three-year thesis of what Cloud Native Kafka is about. Like, I don't know. Maybe calling it like strategy is a bit too much, but uh, it's kind of my belief of where we should be heading and where my team and other teams are driving. Obviously, it's kind of a very collaborative effort. And that, those are the things you said, I said, just said, like about the experience, about focusing on uh, really users who no longer want to think about boxes. And then I basically had the four uh, team leads, um, trying to think, two from my team, and then one from our cloud control plan and infrastructure team, and one from the Kafka storage team, and have them each kind of write a deep dive on the problems in a specific space and our learning on how to approach it. And the target audience is not really people who will use the cloud, even though they may find it really interesting, it's really people who are writing their own cloud services. Like I have a lot of friends today, I think we both kind of even swapped uh, 
messages about like Star Tree, starting the uh, Pinot company. Like we're just seeing all those companies basically take an open source technology and take it to the cloud. So I really tr- we really focused on, okay, we're trying to help our friends out here. What best advice can we give them? So in many ways, if you're, it's more kind of behind the scenes on Confluent Cloud than something that is a very useful takeaway as a user. But obviously we're all engineers and I, I enjoy reading the behind the scenes of S3 as much as everyone mm-hmm. is. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, you, you always want to pick at how stuff actually works, even though you know there's absolutely no reason for you to care well, about like the it. First, the first article in this space that I can remember reading was about how, and this was a good 10 years ago or so, Facebook engineers were rewriting Ethernet drivers on the servers that they had in their, you know, like, I'm mean, like, this is so great. <laughs> like, early in my career, I cut my teeth on, on code like that, uh, you know, like device code. And so... That was super fun, and I'm like, oh man, yeah, I guess you would have to have you would have to do that to make that work at that scale. I so yeah, it's fun, that. pointless, but but you know, yeah. We need or I was inspired to like a career changing degree by reading the DynamoDB paper from AWS. Oh. That was like 2008. Mm-hmm. Um, like this was the first time I was like, oh, actually, you know, I until now I had a successful career on doing relational database architectures. But I, as a data architect, I can go a step beyond that. So uh, if I hadn't read that paper, who knows if I would have ever known to appreciate Kafka. <laughs> That's, I didn't know that uh, that paper also launched you in this direction. It launched a few open source distributed databases. Exactly. Um, and even, and them, even yeah. an early J. Krebs project. Uh, those of us, if you know, you know, uh, Voldemort. Yes, yep. exactly. Because you read a paper and it, they make it look easy. And then two years and a lot of gray hairs later, and you're like, no, <laughs> they cheated. <laughs> so I think in our papers, we didn't have the goal of making Kafka look easy. And in many ways, we actually had the goal of making Confluent Cloud look as hard as it was in practice, because uh, we gain nothing by making it look easy. <laughs> right, right. So we, we were fairly transparent to a degree that made a lot of product managers and marketing people <laughs> uncomfortable. Uh, but That's that was something that was important to us because, again, like our target is people who may try to do it themselves and just they have to know that it's not mm-hmm. easy at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, so we wrote about the four big areas in our uh, space. We started with elasticity. And again, like it sounds easy, you just put more machines. How hard can it always been elastic. You had, you had brokers. Yeah, Done. so this was actually an excuse to do a really deep dive into our control plane. Okay. And the main feedback I got is that we should do even deeper deep dive into our control plane because not many people know our control plane is Kafka driven. And a lot, you know, you had in your show so many people talk about microservice patterns and architectures. We used a lot of those and we tried a bunch of those and some worked and some had were more difficult to implement than we expected. So we kind of just give the big architecture and it we show some of the decisions we made. But yeah, we may need to dive there a bit deeper because it's almost like Kafka and microservices architectures in practice on a use case that we all know and love. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Now I- I guess I knew I knew the control plane was Kafka based, and that all makes sense. But there you go, yeah. Yeah, exactly that. And then the second blog post is around our chase toward the performance and scalability. And this is one place where I can say this is day one, like very literally. Um, our goal is for Confluent Cloud to be more performant than any other Kafka cloud service nice. in existence. Okay. So we did some steps and the key insight around it is that the reason we can do it, how can you even do it, right? I mean, Apache Kafka is out there. You're using the same Kafka as everyone else. But the key things that we have is that we have thousands of customers and their workloads to learn from. And we can actually make it faster and tune it and improve it four specific workloads that we're seeing in production and nobody else is seeing as much customer performance data as we do. I mean, it's um, 
above and beyond, and we obviously have the chops to actually say, oh, actually nobody knew that enterprise companies use a lot of access control lists. And it turns out that they do. How can we make a customer with many access control lists better performing, essentially? Okay. Okay. So we're kind of targeting specific types of customers, like it's not super general purpose, uh, but we do believe that we can be maybe even 10x faster for very meaningful production, real world production workloads, not artificial benchmarks than any of our competitors. So obviously, as I said, we're not 10x faster now. Uh, If we're lucky on some things, we may be 50% faster, but it's still pretty cool. So we talk a bit about not about the numbers as much as the process that we're using to get there and how we're using the fact that we have production workloads as a competitive advantage, essentially. Yeah, mm-hmm. which makes sense because we do. This is I mean, you use what you have, right? We're, we're real good at running Kafka in the cloud is, is another, this is just a slightly more sophisticated way of saying that. Exactly that. It's, this, I'm to, I was talking about like a very, very specific way of, and you frame it really nicely generally. But I think that's the main thing, right? I mean, we have some competitors. I mean, let's be honest, we will never be as big as AWS, but we can definitely be a lot more uh, focused on things that matter to our customers because we are so much closer to them on things like Kafka. <laughs> yeah. And we, uh, you know, it's all we do. So when you're the the smaller, more focused business, and it's funny, we're, I, don't, I don't feel like we're a very small business. Compared to AWS, we're very small. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, tiny uh, and super focused, laser focused on being good at this one thing and taking care of customers. Exactly. You can always exactly. out out innovate. Uh, exactly if, that. If you got that narrow so, focus. Yeah. But yeah, we're trying. To, that's exactly it. We're trying to out innovate. Yeah. So yeah. you've got elasticity. You've got scalability and performance. What was next? Yeah. So multi tenancy okay. is the next one, and I think that's the one place if you are on a multi tenant cluster, like this is the basic and standard SKUs. The ones that are not called dedicated are in fact multi-tenant. It's so simple. So uh, if you are on any of those, it may feel good to see the effort we did to actually guarantee you really amazing isolation, both on the security layer, on the data layer, and on the performance layer. And this is like literally like PhD level uh, work, like you could do okay. multiple research papers on what we did there. And I think uh, the Anna Hovzner's blog post really uh, illustrates both the challenges and our very unique approach. Uh, unlike anyone else, we're not using containers to drive multi tenant Kafka because Kafka is in Java and containers are not always the best approach. Even if you do like Lambda serverless, you know that yeah, Java is not the best <laughs> language. Yeah, yeah. For, warm, uh, warm starting and, and things are, you get you get startup time things that don't Yeah, exactly. Good. So it has to do the just-in-time compil- compilation and it um, takes like, you know, a bunch of me- memory just for itself. And so um, there are ways around it. Like I can see that, hey, if you have like uh, Graal VM and all those things, but that's proprietary. <laughs> So we really, we ended up building multi-tenancy into Kafka. And this is, uh, and we detail a lot, we share a lot of details on how. And um, it's always like native Apache Kafka capabilities. So it's, uh, yeah, that, that's a cool thing. We actually uh, didn't really, we could do deliver a unique experience without holding back on the technical capabilities that we give the community. And I think that's kind of the whole approach to cloud native Kafka in general is that we're focusing on the experience that customers have and we use Kafka capabilities to do it. Right. And building and Kafka out of Kafka has always been what Kafka does. So it's nice. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah. Yes. And yes. So the other happening. thing that I recommend this blog post is to people who are on the fence. Do I really need multi-tenant or should I go with dedicated? Because the the cost is ex- like the cost difference is extreme. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's it's a and it's a hard decision. Yeah, and, and it makes sense that it should be because 
In one case, yep. you've got the economics of the cloud. Uh, exactly. And in the other case, you've got dedicated, dedicated, well, I won't say dedicated hardware, dedicated instances. Yeah, exactly. So in one in, in one scenario, you actually pay for a lot of the underlying costs. And in one case, we actually get to amortize it. Yes. Uh, so just like going to a gym, you don't actually imagine the difference between a private gym and a gym membership. Uh, so I think maybe reading about how multi-tenant works will help make it easier for people to decide that, yes, actually multi-tenant is secure enough and performant enough for my needs, and I can uh, afford to pay less and get the experience I need. And that's, again, you said basic, standard, and dedicated. So basic and standard are the two multi-tenant cluster types. Exactly. Basic is really like a development-only. Standard is the, the production. Yeah, standard, standard is the one you can take to production. Then, yeah, and dedicated is... Uh, well, it's it's not multi-tenant, and there are other feature differences, right? So you need to look at what's going on in terms of the current feature set yeah. of those things. Yeah, exactly. So what you're saying is, if you're just thinking, uh, well, it's multi-tenant, it's shared, that's not secure enough, I better pay for dedicated. Maybe you can get a better value, and you know, feel okay about the security by reading Anna's blog post. I- or maybe you will read it and say, no, this is actually not good enough for any dedicated. Right, right. But, but you, you now will get to have make that deeper understanding of how to make there your decision. You and that's Anna Povsner, once and future guest on this podcast. She's been on, I think, twice before. And a uh, great author, just somebody that, that you should just follow in general. So. Yeah. Um, and then the last uh, blog in the series is the storage durability audit. And this is so unique both in the fact that it exists, because there is no other thing like that for Kafka, and in the fact that we're telling you about it. Because if you think about that, you can imagine again that S3 probably does some things around the scene to make sure your data stays uncorrupted forever, Uh, but um, they don't really tell you how they do it. So you don't really know what kind of guarantees you should expect. And I was super impressed by the work our team did. So I basically went over and begged them to contribute it. And um, here is the thing. When you write um, data to the to Kafka, you kind of have some expectation of how long it will stay there. Yes. But nobody actually checks. Like if you, and you can imagine that mistakes has been made either through operator error or some bugs, um, even has happened to a um, Confluent Cloud where we thought that we created a compacted topic and therefore data should stay forever. And due to a race condition uh, in a client that uh, we used and we haven't tested super deeply, we actually, yeah, I know it was embarrassing. Okay. We ended up... Um, with a seven-day retention, the default. And um, this can definitely lead to uh, data loss if you don't catch it in time. Mm-hmm. And we're not the only ones to whom it happened. Like, we're getting... I get a lot of customer support cases. People, The race condition existed for a while. People don't know about it. People make mistakes. People expect that if they create a topic and immediately change its configuration, um, it, they will end up with a new configuration. It Because of the asynchronous nature of both operations, it may not end up exactly the way you expect. You actually need to check that the topic was created first. Uh, <laughs> lessons learned. Okay, uh, but once then we the figure- second admin API call to change the topic is operating on a topic that doesn't exist yet. And- exactly. Okay. Exactly. There you go. Um, <laughs> mistakes were made. Mistakes were made uh, yes. by us. Yeah, exactly that. <laughs> exactly that one. Uh, by us, but also by other people. It's a natural mistake to make. Totally, I totally. Would say. Like, I mean, it was um, d- like in general, uh, async processing is hard. Mm-hmm. So we figured out that it's a natural mistake to make. And we also figured out that when you store data, and you have expectations, not all points in time and not all, yeah, not every point in time is equally vulnerable. 
Like, because we could check, say we're checking every 14 days, doing check some uh, something and checking the validity of your data. But maybe 14 days is too often or maybe it's not often enough. Who knows? The unique insight from the really brilliant uh, Kafka storage team and Rohit was that specific points in time are more vulnerable. For example, when you change configuration, you may be more vulnerable. Uh, of course. When we add, uh, when we upgrade Kafka, it may be more vulnerable. When you expand and shrink the cluster, it may be slightly more vulnerable because you start moving stuff around. So there are specific times where it's more important to check than others. So we really built this auditing capability into Kafka that when an important event happens, we double check the storage to make sure that your data is still there as expected. Okay. I like it. It's like changing lanes or going through an intersection. That's probably when bad things are going to happen. So. Exactly that. Exactly yeah. that. Like imagine that you had, like you don't want safety systems in your car to be overly naggy, uh, but you can imagine that at specific points, you want them to be very, very proactive and naggy. Like my car has one of those automated brakings and it drives me nuts. It's overly sensitive. It actually almost caused accidents by braking, emergency braking in rush hour in the middle of a busy highway. And like literally, like, yeah, something, a big truck moved to the side or something. Yeah, and it's like, ah, beep, 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 beep. Yeah. If it could know that I'm on a busy highway and the last thing I need is for it to emergency break for me uh, versus I'm now going through an intersection and it's actually very, very meaningful, uh, then, uh, yeah, life would be better. <laughs> Luckily, we know that. <laughs> now we know that. So uh, that was um, elasticity, performance and scalability, multi-tenancy, and... Durability. Um, uh, durability, yeah, durability guarantees. One, two, three, four, and there are blog posts on each one of these. Uh, and the work's not done, I assume. Kafka, Kafka is uh, is probably never cloud native enough. What's uh, what's yes. going on now that you can yeah, talk about? Yeah, so can I give a plug? <laughs> Why, please. We planned 2022. We have very exciting projects. We desperately need more engineers to work on those exciting projects. Um. We have like a specific, if you go on LinkedIn or any other of the job sites, there is actually a specific job role for cloud native Kafka engineer. Um, if any of this sounds like, oh yeah, this is amazing, applying research to hard problems to deliver a next generation user experience is exactly what I want to do with the next four years of my career, uh, do ping us. <laughs> um, I will make sure a link shows up in the show notes for that. And I can say... Uh, Gwen might not say this of herself. Gwen is a fantastic person. I would work for her in a heartbeat. So uh, whether it's on her team or not, if it's near her, uh, it's a good idea. So I yeah. feel like Confluent in general has high number of fantastic people. That Fair enough. Are Fair enough. With. Gwen says um, deflecting, deflecting the praise. I um, mean, here you are and you have your own team and they're all amazing. So A lot of good people here. Exactly. <laughs> exactly that. So yeah, definitely worthwhile reaching out. And in terms of project, we're really going to push everything forward across those axes in kind of its logical direction. So if you think about it, for example, in um, elasticity, after you can expand and after you can shrink, what is the next level? Next level is that it will happen automatically, that you will not even have to do it. So we're looking into, and we're, I can't even promise features because we're do, at a stage where we're doing customer research. What is the best way to scale Kafka automatically for you? And obviously people are concerned about costs and timing and all this. So we're going to really invest on next level in that direction. If you think about performance, that's easy, right? Next level is we'll make it faster. <laughs> we'll make it two times faster, maybe 10 times faster. This is kind of obvious. On multi-tenancy, we are really looking to um, improve the robustness of our guarantees. Like right now, we provide a solution, uh, but pretty much everyone is guaranteed a specific slice of the cluster. 
Uh, if the clusters are very busy, you may see higher latency again because there is just more tenants uh, around. And uh, you don't always know in advance what to expect there. So we really want to be clear about the expectations. Like what is the latency you should expect from if you have basic? What is the latency you should expect if you have standard? Um, and under what conditions, like what workloads will actually give you this uh, latency? Because as you know, you can, that's something that I always tell our customers, you can make Kafka arbitrarily as slow as you want, and you can make Kafka arbitrarily as fast as you want. And a lot of it is on the client side and how you tune your workload and taking the same workload, changing, linger MS is kind of the classic uh, situation. You can literally 10x uh, the performance of a workload by changing that. So we want to kind of give customer visibility around the performance you, they get and what would they do to get them to where it is and what they could do to, if they want to, to make it better. And we want to do it on dedicated and on multi-tenant as well. So it's kind of like very uh, next step, but we really see customers looking for those uh, performance guarantees in a lot of situations. And then on the storage side, you can imagine that if we detect that something went wrong, obviously it makes sense that we will restore it automatically. And I believe that this is something we already do for you, but it means that we have backups and a way to restore your data automatically. Why do, maybe you don't want us to detect that something is wrong. Maybe something is logically wrong for you. You did something wrong. An engineer deployed something and wrote a bunch of crap. And if Confluent has the ability to restore, why? You never would, know. Right? Yeah. So, so, yeah, it, it's 2022 is going to be a very exciting year for us. <laughs> it really sounds like a lot of good work planned. My guest today has been Gwen Shapira. Gwen, thanks for being a part of Streaming Audio. Thank you, Tim. Always a pleasure. And there you have it. Thanks for listening to this episode. Now, some important details before you go. Streaming Audio is brought to you by Confluent Developer. That's developer.confluent.io, a website dedicated to helping you learn Kafka, Confluent, and everything in the broader event streaming ecosystem. We've got free video courses, a library of event-driven architecture design patterns, executable tutorials covering KSQL DB, Kafka streams, and core Kafka APIs. There's even an index of episodes of this podcast. So if you take a course on Confluent Developer, you'll have the chance to use Confluent Cloud. When you sign up, use the code PODCAST100 to get an extra $100 of free Confluent Cloud usage. Anyway, as always, I hope this podcast was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, you can always reach out to me at TLBergland on Twitter. That's T-L-B-E-R-G-L-U-N-D. Or you can leave a comment on the YouTube video if you're watching and not just listening, or reach out in our community Slack or forum. Both are linked in the show notes. And while you're at it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and to this podcast wherever fine podcasts are sold. And if you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover us, which we think is a good thing. So thanks for your support, and we'll see you next time.